Uh, we have a few people and we're, our count is jumping up to about 30 folks right now. So I'm just gonna give it another minute that we'll get, we'll get going. Um, okay, we're at 33 in a room. Okay, well, uh, I like to start things on time. So uh, <laughs> we're gonna move this uh, program along quite a bit. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Lamy. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs and Community Relations at Bloomfield College. It's my honor to be a host, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the Summer 2020 Social Justice Town Hall Forum. Our hope is to create a series of these types of conversations on our campus in the coming months on issues surrounding equity, diversity, inclusion, gender. Um, we're a campus that's extremely diverse, and these conversations belong here at Bloomfield College. Today's program will include a virtual welcome from our student government president, as um, he had to work today, as most young college students have to do sometimes. He had a conflict this afternoon. Then I will provide a brief introduction of our panelists, and I will turn the program over to my colleague, Terrence Bankston, who will be a moderator for this afternoon. All of our viewers are invited to post questions to our panelists during the conversation. We'll try our best to answer those questions as quickly as we possibly can. Some may not get answered, but we'll do our best work to, to make sure that anything that comes from the audience is, um, is addressed some way, somehow. Now I'm going to ask Terrence to populate the screen with the um, video um, welcome from our student government president. I would like to say all lives can matter to Black Lives Matter. Please bring justice to Breonna Taylor's family. To my African American brothers and sisters, I want you to know that our voices will be heard. We need to be motivated and proactive to accomplish our goals we have set out. It is imperative to stand for something that you believe in. To do so, you will need to go above and beyond. You will have to learn that there will be trials and tribulations. There will be moments when you may feel hopeless or uncertain of whether or not everything you have done is worth something. I have to say to you as your student government president, shake those thoughts off. Always keep faith that justice will be served one day. We have been mistreated continuously by the evil men and women in our society. Yet you have to remain confident that we will eventually be able to walk outside of our homes. We have to continue to stick together and fight against these forces that continue to oppress us today. We have to work together to be able to project ourselves upwards. We have to remain vibrant and task driven. And through these actions, we will achieve every goal that has been put forth. And now today is my honor to present our host for the evening. Dr. Patrick Lamy. Thank you, Kyle. Um, and I wish you were here in person, but we appreciate the virtual um, address. Um, I want to start by um, thanking all our panelists for, for joining us and really bringing a wealth of extraordinary um, knowledge and experience to today's conversation. I'm going to do a brief uh, introduction of each panelist, after which I'm going to ask them one simple question. I'm going to ask you to start thinking about that now, is um, why did you agree to participate in this conversation after I introduce all of you briefly before I turn everyone over to Terrence, because I kind of want to hear some personal thoughts of um, why this topic may bring a level of passion um, that's somewhat different. I think our audience would like to hear that before we get to the questions that are prepared and the questions that are going to come from the audience. The first person I need to introduce is obviously my boss, the person who I'm responsible to, <laughs> uh, uh, President Dr. Marquita Evans, 
whose vision um, this was to have this forum and to have several others like it. Dr. Evans became the 17th president of Bloomfield College on June 1, 2019. She recently celebrated her first year. She made history at the college being both the first woman and the first African American to hold the role of college president in 150 years of the college's history. She brings 25 years of higher education experience to her presidency, with 20 of those years serving at minority serving institutions in Texas. Um, next, I want to introduce, thank you and welcome, Dr. Evans. I want to introduce Aaron Green. Welcome, Aaron Green. Aaron Green is the Associate Counsel for New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Aaron a recent, is a recent graduate of the University of South Carolina Law School. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in Public Relations from the University of South Carolina in 2016. Aaron served as the 2017 Diversity Initiative Summer Intern at the Law School Admissions Council. In summer 2018, Aaron was an Ella Baker legal intern in the Center for Constitutional Rights and was a coordinator for the Right to Vote movement in 2019. Welcome, Aaron, to the panel. Next, I want to introduce Patricia Williamson. Patricia is the director of the, the, the New Jersey Counts Project, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, New Jersey. Patricia, um, Patricia is leading the Institute's work to ensure that there is a complete and accurate count of New Jersey urban communities in the 2020 census. She is also an adjunct professor at Bloomfield College now for quite a few years. Although her professional background has been in the telecommunications sector, she has plenty of experience volunteering in civic engagement and social justice. Patricia is currently the New Jersey coordinator for the Eastern Region Social Acting Act Action Committee for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I always make sure I say that correctly for all the Del Deltas who may be listening. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, director Samuel DeMeo, director of the Bloomfield Police Department. Sammy DeMeo began his career in law enforcement in 1986, following in his father's footsteps and joining the Newark Police Department. Throughout his 28-year career in North Police Department, DeMeo ascended from patrolman to police director. Sammy DeMeo was involved in the, in the creation of the Essex County Major Crimes Task Force and was an active participant in the FBI's Violent Crime Task Force as well. In 2011, Director DeMeo was appointed as Newark's police director. He retired from Newark in 2014 and joined the Bloomfield Police Director as Bloomfield Police Department as director in 2014. Welcome, Director DeMeo. Judge Victoria Pratt is the former Chief Judge, Newark Municipal Courts in New Jersey. Judge Pratt has gained national and international acclaim for her commitment to reforming the criminal justice system during her tenure as Chief Judge in Newark Municipal Courts. She spent gaining years getting deep understanding how justice could be delivered to court participants in a manner that has to increase their trust in our legal system and change their behavior. Now, Judge Pratt is a professor at the Rutgers Law School in Newark and teaches problem-solving justice and restorative justice. Welcome, Judge Pratt. A special welcome to all of our panelists. And um, as I mentioned earlier, before I turn you over to Terrence Bankston, who will serve as your moderator um, and, and lead with a series of questions, I asked all of you to share very briefly um, why were you interested in this particular topic today? And I'll ask our president to start with a response. Dr. Evans, please. Sure, and first again, I also want to extend my thanks to everyone for agreeing to participate on this panel. As, as you know, as Dr. Lamy mentioned, um, this is something that's been near and dear to my, my heart for a very, very long time. Uh, and of course, it's just accelerated with what's happened in the past few months uh, that we've seen on the, the, the media. Um, but, you know, growing up, and some of you've heard the story, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to repeat it again, but I grew up in the late 50s and 60s in the state of Alabama. Uh, at the height of the civil rights movement. And during that time, we had our protests, we had our assass assassinations actually that occurred during the 60s as well. And so this has been my mission in my whole life to make sure that I'm put in a position where number one, others can see themselves in me. Um, you know, as Dr. Lamy mentioned at the very beginning, being a female, dealing with gender issues, and then also being a person of color, specifically black, um, I, I wanted others to realize and see too that if Marquita coming up, being raised and legally adopted by my grandmother, that if, if I can be a president of a college, they can too as well. Let nothing hold them back from housing insecurity, which I didn't have, but food insecurity to a certain extent. Um, you know, this has become a passion of mine. So again, my background is in counseling. 
Uh, it's about helping. I've been a teacher, uh, educator for many, many years. I've taught, I always say, from the cradle to the grave. I've taught elementary all the way up to doctoral students. And so again, being that person in front of them, helping them to understand the conscious biasness that they may have and, and how they relate. Sometimes being that only one person that they've seen that's a person of color sometimes in the classroom or any kind of leadership position, uh, I needed to have that impact. And so having this social justice town hall forum today and a series of others that we'll, I will be working with the faculty and the staff on and the community. Specifically, I want to give a shout out to uh, Director DeMeo for reaching out to us and saying, how could he help? How could he again work with the, the college from a proactive versus reactive stance? Uh, that's what we're looking for at Bloomfield College. And so again, a special thanks to him for agreeing to be on this panel too, as well as well as everyone else. So that's my take. I can keep talking on and on on this, but uh, that's why I'm on here today. Thank you, Dr. Evans. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on folks. Judge Pratt, I'll ask you to <laughs> answer that next. Well, good, uh, good afternoon and thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to make one correction. I'm actually at the School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers now. Um, I'm, I agree to do this panel. I typically, the, the, the truth is, you know, Pat Lammy calls and Dr. Lammy calls and you say yes. But <laughs> I've always wanted to change the world. And I, what I know is that in every audience that I got an opportunity to change, to speak and connect with someone who also knows that they can shift an entire industry by just showing up and doing the work. So that's why I am agreed to do this. I kind of, I, I go around globally talking about reforming systems and talking to people about improving justice for the people that we serve, because yes, we are judges, we are police officers, but we are public servants. And so that's why it was important to at least lend my voice to this topic today. Thank you, Judge Pratt. I will ask um, Patricia Williamson to chat next. Okay, well, it, as Judge Pratt said, when, when Dr. Patrick Lammy asks, and Dr., you, you say yes. yes. That, that's the first reason. And, but uh, having, having known Dr. Lammy and uh, Dean Mitchell, I see you, and, and as well as just meeting Dr. Evans, and having been at this, this school officially for three years, I've, uh, I've always had a, uh, a passion to help young people, particularly in the college space. And having the opportunity to do so at Bloomfield College has really been helpful. Seeing the freshmen come in and helping them uh, adjust to the college life, that new transition of becoming an adult, that's, that's one thing that really um, impacts what I do. When you add to that, uh, just the social action of what was mentioned of what I've been doing in Delta and now with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, helping young people see what they can do right now as young people is really important because a lot of times they're, they're hearing a lot about what they can't do, but there's so many more things you can do. And so having the opportunity to talk about that in a group of esteemed people here as yourselves, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm hoping that there's something that I, I may be able to impart that may encourage someone to, to go out and um, get into a little good trouble. Thank you, Patricia. I'm gonna ask Director DeMeo, then he'll be followed by Aaron Green. Thank you, Dr. Lamy, Dr. Evans, everyone on the panel. It's great to be here today. Um, one of the, the first reasons that I jumped at the opportunity to be on this panel was um, the wanting of us as a police department here in Bloomfield to connect more with the college and, and the college community. Um, we also want to hope that we can connect with the college as a recruitment platform uh, for our police department here in Bloomfield. Um, there's many different things we can do with the college, and we want to have more kind of like a a system set up where if, whether it's monthly or, or quarterly or whatever it may be, where our community policing people, myself, come over to the college and just have an open forum with the students, where we're not only coming to the college when there's an issue, when somebody's calling the police because there was an argument or somebody stole something. We wanna be, as a police department, 
the faces are known by the students. We want to know the students and we want them to know us. We really successfully did that with our elementary schools and our high school with our youth programs that we've been doing for the last four years, our summer youth academy, where they're connected for, for weeks on end throughout the summer and they all get to know each other and, and realize that, hey, they're not just that evil bad police officer, you know, they're here to help us. They're here to be here for us. And we really want to make that connection with the college as well. Thank you, Director Graham. Now introducing Aaron Green. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lammy, Dr. Evans, uh, fellow panelists in the Dual Field College. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, well, I'll say for two reasons I uh, did this panel when we uh, first received the invitation of uh, being a member of the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice, a legal advocacy organization uh, that centers on um, uh, a mechanism from the ground up. What can we do in our communities to make change? Um, and this uh, panel discussion uh, centers on that, right? Um, and goes to my second point of young people and strategy. That was in the goals uh, for, for the panel we held. And that plays a pivotal role, not only in this moment, but historically, right? When we think about um, uh, uh, Congressman Lewis and seeing uh, his, his casket uh, going to Edmund Pettus Bridge for the last time, I thought about the hundreds of foot soldiers who at that time uh, were young, right? They were in their 20s, some were teenagers uh, that crossed that bridge uh, to move us forward. And there's so many examples that I'll go into uh, later in our discussion of how young people have played a pivotal role in moving us forward, um, not only in this country, uh, but in this world. So uh, excited to be here today. Thank you, Aaron. I certainly want to introduce my colleague, Rose Mitchell, who's on here as well. She's at the bottom. Rose is the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs at the college. Um, welcome, Rose, and I'm sure you're going to have some questions for our panelists um, during this, this conversation. Um, I'm going to ask Terrence to kind of take lead from this point onward. Um, we have a series of questions that are, you know, we're hoping that our panelists can, can walk us through. We're also welcome questions from the audience that I'll try to monitor as best as I can during this conversation. Terrence? Thank you, Dr. Lammy, and as always, uh, Dr. Evans, thank you for your leadership um, and just your courageous spirit. It is definitely um, uh, necessary and needed here at Bloomfield College, and so we appreciate you. On behalf of CSLE, welcome. Uh, thank you, panelists, members, for joining us today. So let's just jump right into it. We have questions from students, questions from staff, and um, I always believe in ladies first, so we will start off with um, you, Ms. Williamson, well, Williamson, if you don't mind. Um, the first question is just pretty much, what are your thoughts on the recent events across the country, uh, particularly in reaction to the death of George Floyd? And you saw that our president of student body made references uh, to others uh, earlier. Uh, would you like to share uh, your thoughts on that? Sure. I well, hello to everyone. Um, again, it's an honor to be here. I stood during the first funeral service in, in Minnesota. I, when Reverend Sharpton, at the end of the service, asked everyone to stand, I stood in my house by myself for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And it wasn't probably even halfway through when tears started to just come to my eyes and by the end of it I, I was uh, I was just crying because eight minutes and 46 seconds is a long time it's a long time and although the situation was sadly familiar to me because there are so many names that we know before George Floyd uh, I think as people who weren't black watched in horror I think they also realized it was a long time. And it's been a long time since Black people have been treated as less in America. And I think we have the same feeling of discomfort and the need for change as our grandparents and maybe great-grandparents did when they saw the face of 14-year-old Emmett Till. The late John Lewis talked about getting into good trouble and I think the country now seems, seems ready to do that, getting into those uncomfortable conversations. I think they're going to help us get out of some of the uncomfortable ways of our lives. Judge Pratt. Thank you. Um, again, I have to tell you, somebody who's been working the system, 
it was anticipated. Every rope has its end. And it was just case after case and with the advent of technology and with the advent of the internet and people who were beginning to be activists from where they stood, I knew that finally the rope, something would happen. And it was almost as if because the system wasn't working, because our justice system wasn't working and people weren't being held accountable, at some point I knew the public would say that's enough. So I think that while we um, focus also on, while we're focusing and talking a lot about um, the police brutality aspect of it, I think that we're also talking and people are also responding to the brokenness of the justice system, to what justice should look like, and that it keeps coming up in a way that the citizens aren't being served. So if a regular person does this particular crime, there's accountability, a person gets um, sentenced. If they're people of color disproportionately, they get disproportionate uh, punishment for these sentences. And we see it as a person who's working in the system. There are already studies that show that people who are darker skin and who have more African features get more severe sentences than their white counterparts and even their own black counterparts. And I think that um, we, 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 there, there was, um, foreshadowing that this that ultimately people were screaming at these institutions screaming at legislators something has to change and surprise i'm saddened by it saddened by it because the system has been devoid of treating people with humanity and so when you talk about the standing for eight minutes if you saw an, a human being that you were engaged with you wouldn't have been able to behave that way and so where is it in the system that we have told folks that it's okay to take the humanity away from people because they just get stopped or because someone makes a mere allegation. So I, I was anticipating this. What, what has been um, good to see is that um, what has been happening to African Americans has been seen as happening to Americans. So there's been this cross-cultural and even this global outrage. I don't know what I was looking at the other day and someone said, Judge, oh, I was on a call and someone from South Africa was talking about George um, Floyd in her writings and to hear his name with this accent and how much it impacted her from halfway across the globe was just um, really powerful to me about not only what we have to do here, but that people are looking at us here and we're, and we're doing and we're failing in America. We're really failing in this space. Dr. Evans, uh, being the president of the college and having you have a, a lot of uh, uh, tons, really, of, of young black and brown uh, babies uh, who you care a lot about. Uh, as a president of a, of a institution that is predominantly of color, um, what are your con uh, concerns, comments, or thoughts uh, towards the events that have been occurring? You know, I want to go back and, and, and kind of comment on a couple of things. I don't know if, uh, uh, Patricia, you realize that Emmett Till's birthday was July 25th. Uh, just just occurred and I thought I would share that uh, only because again you know I was talking to my daughter who is a professor at Auburn uh, University and she and I were talking and I was telling her about this town hall today and uh, she is truly an activist so to speak reminds me of you Aaron uh, as far as just the kind of the conversation and how the young people are going to lead how they've always led when you look at John Lewis and when he, when he was walking across that bridge I think he was a teenager or whatever when he was in, in, when he got hit upside the head maybe in his early 20s um, you know, so again, looking at our young people, looking at what their needs are, and how do we support them as an institution. So my daughter did this podcast, where again, um, I was at the University of Texas San Antonio, and it was dealing with how some of the students of color were being treated on campus. And I actually pulled this quote that I'm going to share with you. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bell Hooks. But Bell Hooks is well known in the social justice arena and has done tons of work related to educators, teachers. And so she wrote this quote and it goes like this, the unwillingness to approach teaching from a standpoint that includes awareness of race, sex, and class is often rooted in the fear that classrooms will be uncontrollable, that emotions and passions will not be contained. To some extent, we all know whenever we address in the classroom subjects that students are passionate about, there is always a possibility of confrontation, forceful expression of ideas, or even conflict. And what I, why I thought that quote was real important for me to share with you today is that this is the reason why I'm having this town hall or wanting to have this town hall is that we have to have these critical conversations. 
and we cannot be afraid of them. I've talked to students in certain classes when you bring up issues of race or dealing with any type of social injustice, they may talk about it in one class, they may talk about it for 15 minutes, but most of the times the faculty or whomever they're talking to are afraid to engage in the conversations or really having that in-depth conversations with our young people for us to understand the experiences that they're going through now. You know, I'm trying to help people when they start coming to me and asking me, well, Marquita, you know, as a, as, as, as a, as a white person uh, saying, what can I do? And I'm looking at them and having that conversation and thinking, do the right thing. <laughs> you know, this is not like rocket science. When you see injustice, how do you manage it and move forward? When our students are experiencing certain things and I have a faculty member that is disrespectful for them, to them in their tone, in their response, um, see our students for who they are, the, the brilliance that they bring. A lot of our students are first generation. I, I feel like I'm getting on a soapbox right now. First generation help them learn how to navigate the world in which we live in. And unfortunately though, this world that we live in has penalized them more. Students are suspended at a, at a uh, students of color specifically, black and brown at a greater rate or expelled. Uh, the punishment is usually higher. The young lady last week where the judge put her in jail for not doing her homework. I mean, I, that's like unfreaking believable to me. So, you know, I go on and on and on, but in my role, the whole reason of having positional power now is to say that I want these talk, town halls, these difficult critical conversations to occur and not just the conversations, we've got to have actions. We've got to have results. And it doesn't mean again, that it has to be negative and negative. People look at the word confrontation and in counseling, we talk about confronting something. Confronting something is looking at it, pros, cons, and seeing what we can do to move forward. This is the conversation we're having now. How do we move forward? And thank God for the camera on the back of these uh, iPhones or whatever you have, smartphones, because it's putting it out there more and more. It's been out there, but now people are being able to just see it and feel it emotionally. And as a result of that, we have black, brown, all types of individuals that are walking out there um, protesting. And it just brightens my heart when the activists are not just me, you know, people that look like me. There are others just saying a change has got to happen and it's got to happen now. Uh, one of our attendees, John, shared in the chat, uh, just thanking uh, the college for doing this, but saying Bloomfield College has an opportunity to be a guiding light in New Jersey by hosting events like this and showing how wonderfully diverse school can become um, a leading voice in the discussion. Ding Mitchell, you have a recent graduate. You also have a college-aged daughter. What message should we share with the younger generation about social justice and injustice in the United States? And then I'll ask Aaron to follow up with a response on to that question as well. Thank you for that question, Terrence, because I have two children, a daughter who is 19, who's going back to her college campus that is predominantly white, and I have concerns for her, as I've always had concerns. Um, I have a son who is 21, who just recently finished college. And my husband and I were constantly talking to him about um, his hairstyle, um, the hoodies that he liked to wear, and why they are not appropriate, perhaps, in certain communities, because they may not be accepted, or he may be labeled a certain way. Um, the car that he drives, uh, which is a, happens to be a, a sports car, we're concerned now about that. More concerned about the car he drives, his hoodie and his hair, more so now than ever because of what is happening in the world, especially George Floyd. So. I, I, truthfully, I am afraid for my son, but I always tell him to be truthful to who he is as a person. And the way that we raise our young children is important. The way that we raise our black sons and daughters matter. But it's unfortunate that we live in a society where they are viewed by the color of their skin first. And I had a student that said to me, about a couple of weeks ago, she said, what do you do when a person see you, see the color before seeing you as the person? 
And that's a hard reality that people of color have to endure. So I say to our young people that, you know, be proud of who you are as a person and communicate with others and be true to yourself. I always tell my daughter, shine in your own star. And what does that mean? It means be truthful to who you are as a young black woman, as an educated black woman. And, and just have these difficult, you heard Dr. Evans say it, having these difficult conversations are necessary. And Terrence, back to that, I remember when I moved into my particular town, I was told, well, you know, they don't accept black people. And I said, well, they're going to accept this black family because we're not going anywhere. And so we had to really put ourselves out there to get to know our neighbors and have our neighbors to get to know us as people first, even though they might have seen just black faces coming into their neighborhood. We wanted them to get to know us who we are as people, what are our ethics, what are our values, what characteristics we have. We wanted to be judged on who we are as people with values and integrity, more so than you just seeing someone move into your neighborhood that doesn't look like you. So we have to have these difficult but necessary conversations. Aaron, and then we'll, I have a, a, a law enforcement related question for our director, uh, DeMeo, but I wanted to get uh, Aaron's uh, response. What should we share with the younger generation, with the younger generation about social justice and just injustice? Thank you for the question, Terrence. Um, I think, um, well, in this moment, right, where we have the COVID-19 pandemic, not only that, right, where we have economic disparity, where we have millions of people out, out of work, uh, millions facing eviction. Um, we have the system of mass incarceration. So much that is going on um, during this moment. But as we look historically as well, this has always been going on in America, especially for Black people, um, from the original kidnapping onward. And one of the things that uh, I like to uh, do is uh, learn from our history because it, 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 it allows for a pathway as we move forward. So I want to highlight a few moments in our time where young people have played a pivotal role in shifting uh, the narrative in our country. Uh, I could start in February 1st, 1960 in Greensboro, the Greensboro Four college students at North Carolina a &T that sat down um, um, at a restaurant that did not serve uh, black people. And what that, that action led to was 55 cities across, um, uh, well, 13 states across the country, 55 uh, different actions of people organizing this, uh, against that form of discrimination. And it led to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, which led to the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, that type of organizing that they engaged with. What, what, what's important about that example is that it started in Greensboro from the ground up in a small community uh, where they uh, attack certain actions. So I know sometimes we see all these things that are going on and we're like, how can we solve this? How can we solve that? But it's important to look into what's going on in your community, right? What's happening with poverty? Um, what's happening with incarceration? How can we tackle that in our community? You never know how that may change uh, the uh, dynamics in your community, but also what may spark um, uh, around the country. And historically also from the lynching movement, Ida B. Wells, uh, she pushed for the anti-lynching movement. She was 29 years old when she started that movement, which led to the ending of that system of where thousands of black men and women and children are home from trees. So every time we've seen a form of oppression, um, there has always been a form of resistance, right? And a lot of times that resistance has been uh, carried by young people. And in this moment where we've seen 26 million people since the death of Breonna Taylor, 26 million people have taken to the streets, majority of young people, the largest movement in our history. During a pandemic, people have taken to the streets and we've seen some drastic changes across this country where we've seen people take on, uh, talk about universal basic income. Uh, schools are deciding to um, what public safety looks like in schools, what public safety looks like in cities. Um, and this is just a few weeks. So this is a spark of a movement that I think that will be unprecedented, uh, maybe in our history, but it's important that young people um, are involved, um, are engaged, and also realize that you're not our future, you're our present. 
young people, you are our present because what we do in this moment will determine not only circumstance for ourselves, it will determine the circumstance for the future generations and generations to come. Every moment that we take it, when I, when I reiterate that again about the MS Pettis Bridge, those hundreds of high school students and college students that crossed that bridge led, played a pivotal role in the Voting Rights Act and transferring, transforming uh, this country to give us more power, right? And with that voting power, we have an election coming up. So I hope that you're going to be engaged with that voting, register people to vote. But more importantly, what are you going to do to hold the elected officials accountable in your community? Um, what can uh, 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 students be doing, engaging, going to city council meetings, uh, looking at the budget, determining is the city utilizing funds in our community for, the, for our best interests? Are they utilizing funds to address issues of homelessness, poverty, uh, education, right? So what can you be doing in your, those are, those are the things you've been engaging with, voting, not only voting, but being a, a active voter, where you're holding elected officials accountable, you're hosting um, uh, candidate forums, um, you're mobilizing, on, connecting to the most vulnerable. The most vulnerable, I always, I always believe, hold the key to our freedom because they're experiencing some of the most oppressive forms of systematic oppression in this country. How can we connect with them, not only connect with them to advocate for them, but how can we also provide resources to them? Because in this moment, as we see economic despair that we haven't seen in decades, um, people are going to be put out of their homes. People are not gonna have jobs, opportunities. So how can we engage with mutual aid funding, right? And providing resources uh, to people in our community that are in need. Um, there's so much I can say about that topic, but I just want to uh, uh, lift that up. Um, as things that young people can be engaged with uh, during this moment. I appreciate that, Aaron, and, and thank you, Dean Mitchell, for your share. Uh, Director uh, DeMeo, it's been said that, um, you know, we can't legislate morality, meaning it's still up to an individual to treat people. We can have civil rights and we can have policies and procedures that say people are to be treated fairly, but it's still up to individuals. So with that being said, I, ha I have a two-part question, and then part of, of, of it comes from our chat. Um, first part is what role can law enforcement and the legal system play in the social justice reform movement? And specifically to Bloom, uh, in, in terms of Bloomfield and the work that you do here, are the demographics of the police force a mirror of the Bloomfield community? Thank you, Terrence. And uh, but before I answer those questions, I just want to start with uh, what we started with. You know, what we as a police department and me as an individual think of the actions that took place in Minnesota. And I just got to say that in my 34 years in this business, that is the most egregious thing that I've ever seen. And I was really happy to find when I started talking on the different social networking platforms with law enforcement executives from all over the country in the police executive research forum, that there was not one police officer or law enforcement executive anywhere in this country that tried to defend what happened there. And I think that was a pivotal moment. I mean, I mean, we've all seen some pretty bad things, but nothing as egregious as that. And it just let us up. We're doing something wrong. Anyone who can go out there, put a uniform on for that many years and have a mindset that doing something like that to an individual is okay, is being trained the wrong way. They're not being disciplined the proper way. And then hence, when we look into it a little bit further, 18 different occasions of police brutality from that police officer, very minimal actions taken against them at all. No retraining, no nothing. That's where it has to start. If you have an officer that can be on your department up until a time where he can commit 18 violent offenses against civilians, well, that's a problem. That person does not belong being a police officer and that should have went way back down the road where that pro he should have been eliminated. As far as law enforcement um, being involved in changes in social justice, I don't think they, sh they can just be involved. I think they need to be involved. You know, there's over 800,000 police officers in the United States of America that have interactions with the public every single day. Unfortunately, the majority of those interactions are negative. And our officers need to be trained constantly that no matter who it is that you're dealing with, no matter what the situation is that you're dealing with, everyone has to be treated with dignity and respect. You can't just treat everyone the same because you think you're going to the same call. Oh, this is another drug call. It's another drug dealer on the corner. Well, maybe it's not a drug dealer on the corner. Maybe it's just somebody that just happens to be standing there talking to somebody, waiting for a bus. Everyone has to be treated differently. And it's our responsibility as the leadership of a township and the leadership of a police department to make sure we do everything we can to make sure that that happens the right way. Not just write a policy 
put it out to the officers and that's it. And you could just say, oh, we have a policy that says you can't do A, B, and C. You have to go back and check is everyone following your policy. Here in Bloomfield, every single day, Internal Affairs is tasked with reviewing telephone conversations, with reviewing body camera footage, and reviewing car uh, camera footage on motor vehicle stops. We do that as a quality control measure to make sure that every police officer in this department is treating everybody with respect and dignity as they should. We preach nothing but customer service. You know, our, our bottom line here is, is not dollars and cents, but we run this place like a business. And that, that our reward to us is citizen satisfaction and reduction in crime and quality of life for the people that live here and visit here. But you have to follow up. Just putting out a policy, like I saw right in the beginning of the George Floyd incident, the whole eight can't wait um, uh, uh, hashtag was out there. So we reviewed them here the very next day, looked through our policies, reviewed and seven of the eight, we already had in our policies here in Bloomfield and we added the eighth. Okay, there's no reason not to, but just doing that and putting it in a policy doesn't mean that, it, okay, that's it, it works. Now you have to go and make sure that your officers are acting the right way. Are they following those guidelines? And if not, they go into a, a training program or to be terminated from the police department. It's very simple. The, the system and the process is in place for policing. It's called progressive discipline. There's computer systems that every police department should be mandated to have that flag officers based on their actions and what the input going into the system is. And that gives you an opportunity to say, hey, there might be a problem with Officer Bankston. He had these, these three incidents that were similar within a 30-day period. Let's take a look deeper. Everything needs to be reviewed. And in my opinion, it can't just be this department does it, that department does it, this one doesn't. It's got to be a national, a national standard where every police department, acts. I mean, after the George Floyd thing, I heard some of the things that were being talked about in some of the Midwestern states about, oh, we should really have, you know, you know no chokehold or, or we should have a review process for, for discipline. These are things that we've been doing here in New Jersey for 10, 15 years that are not being done in other parts of the country. And it just lets officers go rogue. It, it's really, it, it's really an issue. As far as the diversity of this police department, um, you know, it's not something that you can change overnight, unfortunately. We're bound by civil service rules and guidelines. And that's where recruitment, like I was talking about um, earlier, going into the college, doing training opportunities when the test comes out, hosting classes for the students to study and take the civil service examination and getting them on the list. It, it's not something that we can change like that. I'm happy to say that over the, the four and a half years that I'm here under the leadership of Mayor Venezia and the council here, that we have had success with doing community recruitment drives when the two times that there was a test and we have increased diversity with African-Americans, Hispanics, and uh, Latin Latinos in our police department. But it's, you know, I, I explain it this way. When I became a cop in Newark in 1986, the command staff of the police department, which is the leadership, was completely white. There was no diversity there whatsoever. So you had to start somewhere. And you start by hiring people of color, making your ranks of your police department diverse. And then you have the opportunity for those people to take the, the promotional exams, become sergeants, become lieutenants, captains, uh, police director. And that happened through the years. The command staff... Uh, diversification in Newark right now is ma majority minority. It mirrors the community that they serve, but it took a generation to get there. Unfortunately, it's not something that you can just do overnight. I think you're on mute, Terrence. Terrence is still on mute. Terrence, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? I was saying that uh, the tech, uh, director DeMeo is so good that he actually answered a few other questions that actually people had asked in the chat. And so what you were talking about really is like policy changes and best practices. And so I wanted to ask uh, Judge Pratt and, and follow up with President Evans, in your professional judgment, what are the major policy changes that could positively impact change and promote greater, greater equity in America? Wow. Okay. I had an answer to something. Okay. I'm going to answer all of it. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that we can't legislate morality, but what we can do is create a standard for it and then punish when it's not met. Because we do that with everything else. I used to give these lectures and to judges because so I go around the country and I lecture on procedural justice. And I used to say, you know, essentially treat people the way you would want your mother to be treated. And then I realized people don't really like their mamas too much. So I couldn't rely on that, you know? And it's this idea, procedural justice is this idea that if people are treated with dignity and respect and fairly by the justice system, 
not only does it increase the public's trust in the system, but it increases um, compliance with the law, which means it de decreases crime, but it also um, increases satisfaction with decisions that the court makes. Now, when talking about who needs to change, it's the system, practitioners, we need to change. We need to change our approach to the people that come before us. We need to make sure that we are listening. Procedural justice has four um, elements, its voice, its understand, its neutrality, and that it's respect. But you actually have to teach these things to people. Uh, there, there are studies, there's one that just came out this year that found that when um, some officers from Chicago were um, taught procedural justice strategies when they were then sent out to the community that it decreased the use of force and it also decreased the number of complaints they received. Now for me, being on the bench means that I also have to slow down. I have to be cognizant of what my community looks like. In Newark, I knew that many of the people who came to court had very little education. Um, English was often their second language. So how just how I delivered justice to them had to be different. We had to also deal with the fact that people suffer from mental illness so that I'm not always responding with, oh, this person's being disrespectful. No, I'm actually responding to the person who's having, um, who's decompensating before me. And what happens when our police force doesn't know how to do that, when they don't know how to recognize that? And so then we just cycle people through an entire system. So I think that while training, training is key. We have to give people more tools because that's what training is. It's giving people tools to do their job better. When I was becoming a, ju a judge or trying to become a judge, um, then Mayor Booker was told stuff like, oh, you can't make her a judge, she's too little. And I remember thinking, I'm not trying to get on a ride at an amusement park, I'm trying to be a judge. You should be asking, thinking about my legal acumen, my, my judicial temperament. What do I embody the values of the leader of this town, right? And so what was happening is that people believe, and this is what they believe, that judges need to be intimidating, they need to be nasty, they need to be tough. And so if that's the standard that we have for judges and that's how we hire them, then what do we anticipate they will do when they get on the bench? So the same thing happens with police officers. We need to allow our officers to become peace officers again, and not just law enforcement. And also as a community, we have to stop weaponizing them against each other. Cases will come before me and I'm like, this is not something somebody should have ever called the police for, because we need to have a community that in fact deals with this before it ever comes here. I shouldn't have to send this back and I shouldn't even have to talk to you about this because once this person gets processed, so the major changes I think are that. It's really adding this human piece back to our processes and really looking at our processes. Um, people ask me all the time, what do you do when you have bad officers? What do you do when you have bad judges? You get rid of them. That's what you do. You have leadership that says, you don't embody, uh, Mayor Baraka did it, he came in and you know he grew up in the city of Newark and we had judges who had been on the bench since he had been a teenager. And he was like, enough. And he got rid of folks. So um, it's very important. I mean, people get, you get rid of folks in every other form of profession. It is very important that we um, hold people accountable. And not just, you know, we talk a lot about accountability. The, the good thing about procedural justice is that um, my reputation in Newark was Judge Pratt don't play. And I just think that was the funniest thing because I wasn't doing anything, giving them any more severe punishment than anyone else, but it was this relationship of respect that we had. And what I saw even in my courtroom was that when officers were told, this is how we treat people in this space, their behavior changed. And not only did their behavior change, but I noticed that people were starting to tell them, I mean, I guess there's this no snitch rule, but they started getting information about things. The community began to see them differently and react. So you have officers now buying lunch for somebody who typically would maybe go and steal it because he's a peace officer in this community. And that thing exists. We don't see enough of it, but we also have to stop a system that rewards um, aggression and that rewards that, but we also have to hold ourselves accountable. I'm telling judges, when you see this foolishness, you have a responsibility to report it. If the prosecutor gives people offers based on race, if you see the offers look different, don't accept them and call them out on these things. But this is our responsibility. I mean, it's not just, you know, I've been, I've been screaming about this for some time. 
it's the system, the system is messed up the system, but the system is made up of individuals. So we have to shift what is acceptable, how we hire these people, how these people get into office. And I think also um, for this generation, my advice is that they continue to do what they're doing, which is not standing for the behavior that they're seeing, but that they also need to, uh, I mean, more immediately, and I don't know if that's the question as well, but more immediately, you need to um, harness your power as voting blocks, mm. right? Because that's real all the time. What does, and Mr. Bankston knows what I'm talking about because he gathered and got uh, district leaders. And what it means is those are folks who can guarantee votes at election. The city of Newark had about 180 people registered to vote. The mayor wins with 33 or 34,000 votes. That means nobody comes out to vote. College students have to harness, they have to vote and you have to vote in blocks for things that serve your interests. If legislators support reducing and abolishing tuition because the state's gonna pay for it, then you need to vote as a block and then you need to call those people and hold them accountable. Legislators create laws that law officer, law enforcement has to enforce. So. There are things that immediately you can do. Immediately you can make sure your colleagues vote, but that your voting is blocked and that these numbers are coming out. Because that's when legislators come to the table, when you have that kind of power. Dr. Evans, uh, policy, major policy changes that you uh, have assessed need to occur. So I'm going to talk about it from a broader range and not just the police. <laughs> yeah, I know we're talking about George Floyd, but I want to take this to kind of a, a different level for me. You know, I, I go back and again, being an educator to the whole concept of how do we define social justice, right? And social justice is basically a concept of fair and just relations between the individual and society. Simple as that. When we talk about distribution of wealth, opportunities that individuals have for personal activity and things that are happening in their life, social privilege. You know, I have these questions that I go through when things are happening. Who makes these decisions and who is left out? Just think about that. Who has the power to make decisions and who is left out? Who benefits and who suffers when those decisions are made? Why is a given practice fair or unfair? These are questions when we start looking at policy development that we should be asking ourselves. What is required to create change? Now we think about change and things that have happened. I know Aaron was talking earlier about the young people in protest and all those things. And as a result of that, I was on a call um, maybe about two months ago about how we got EOF, okay, Educational Opportunity Fund in the state of New Jersey was a result of the riots that occurred in the 1960s here in New Jersey. Didn't know that until again, just doing some research, being new to the state. And as a result now we have students that are able to get funding that probably wouldn't even be being able to go and get higher education. Now for me, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. And we start talking about policies, I start looking at what I can do on campus, working with my faculty and staff and the students, because the students have to be in here, they have to be valued and their voice matters and respected. I know that as an educator, and even with the VPs and everyone, we just had a retreat that we talked about issues of diversity, what we want to do again to be that leader within the state of New Jersey, what policies and processes do we want to have on our campus, let alone the world. I'm talking about right in my little world right now, Bloomfield College, what can we do to impact the experience that our students are having on our campus? And so we're looking at again, how things are happening, how faculty are evaluated, how students are evaluated, all of those things are critically important because biases creep in. We cannot expect our students coming from the variety of backgrounds for every student to be the same. You know, years ago, decades ago, we used to have everything from the melting pot to the words of equality. Now we're using the word equity, which is really the fairness. Not everybody needs the same thing. I'm sure everybody has seen that little stand, uh, uh, the picture, of, this, of these guys that are standing at a fence, trying to look over a fence. All of them have the same uh, stoop to stand on, being short or small or whatever. Some are taller, some can see over the fence, some can't. Now, if we gave everybody the same thing, it's still not a just or fair system. Not everybody needs, needs the same thing. So me as a, as a college president, working, advocating, looking at our current policies we have on the campus, Going back to the whole voting process, again, making sure that it's not just the president we need to vote for. 
it's those judges, it's those other officials, and I'm learning all the different types of offices you all have, still learning what a freeholder is and uh, county executive, that's a little bit different than Texas. But all of those positions matter, and we need to have, not just because they're Democrat or not just because they're Republican, what is their record and how do they help the community and actually do their work? That's what we've got to educate our students on, the census that Patricia's working with. And I know she's a Delta, I get a shout out to AKAs, but anyway, um, you know, helping them realize too the importance of registering for the census and the impact that has on Bloomfield College. You know, we had to send our students away in the spring and we were working very hard too of trying to make sure that this counts for Bloomfield, which includes Bloomfield College, so we can get some of the resources for the city that we need. That's policies. Those are policies and things that our students need to be aware of that they're not, right? Because they're still thinking that their vote doesn't matter. Their voice doesn't matter. So we've got to switch that not just again talking about the police department, but dealing with health. I can go in and deal with COVID-19. That's a whole nother issue that's going on now. The health disparities that are there because we're dealing with obesity, high blood pressure, uh, you know, just a whole lot of things. Diabetes within the community, the black and brown community. Uh, I know I'm talking too much probably on this, but these are things again that we must be conscious of. As a community, we have to have a community of consciousness. Because again, we talk about unconscious bias. When we ask those questions, who makes the decisions, who's left out, why? It comes all the way back again to this power or perceived power that only a small group of people actually have. And that's because again, they put themselves in positions to, to make that happen. So anyway, I, I've kind of talked on and on. But, no, and, 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 and as always, we appreciate your insight and, and, and wisdom. Um, Martin wants to know, and I, and I would like to direct this to Director DeMeo and then have Patricia uh, follow up. How does the white population gain an understanding of the Black experience so that Ms. Mitchell's observation about her son's hoodie is no longer perceived as threatening? Uh, Director DeMeo, I'm sure you, you deal with perception issues in police officers your whole career. How have you led and managed those expectations? It, it really has to be almost pounded into the heads of the officers that you know everyone is not the same um, you cannot stereotype anyone because of a particular neighborhood that they live in or a particular way they wear their hair you know not everybody that's driving down the street with dreadlocks is a criminal it's a hairstyle and it, it just i clearly see so many times in the media where these separations get get kind of strengthened where they want to show the negative of something where for that same negative that they're showing, there's probably 10 times as, as much positive, but the positive never gets shown. All they want to show is the negative part of everything. And it's just, it's something for us here. You know, like we, we teach our officers um, racially biased uh, policing and how not to, to be biased in your opinions when you're approaching a situation. And it's something that the state mans us, mandates us to do um, every two years. We do it every six months because we want it to be something that's constantly fresh in their mind, that they know approach every situation with a completely open mind. Don't draw a picture of what you think you're walking into just from what you see as you walk up to it. You know, every situation is different. Every person you're going to deal with is different. And it's, you know, it's not easy, you know, especially in some of these places where they're just going to start trying to do stuff like this now. You know, you have officers that have been in a job 15, 20 years already. You know, they're, they're in their minds, they're pretty ingrained on the way that they do their job. And, you know, we talked about, I, I think it was Judge Pratt talked about the training of police officers and how they're trained like, you know, like they're soldier warriors. You look at the typical training at a police academy, it's the whole military regiment, you know, doing push-ups, jumping up and down. Now when they're teaching you how to be tough and oorah and all that. And then now when you come out in the street, you're like, you know, ah, you're ready to go out there and, and save the world. You know, it should be, they should be trained the opposite. This isn't 1970 anymore. You know, you have, they have to be trained to be the counselor that they're going to have to be more than they're going to have to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. and, and quickly, I just want to reference something that, you know, the, the first organized police department was created in the world over 200 years ago. It was created by a person by the name of Sir Robert Peel. It was the uh, London Metropolitan Police Department. First organized police department in the country. 200 plus years ago, there were nine principles of policing that were created that dictated what police work was supposed to be and what police 
uh, policemen were supposed to be. If you have an opportunity, just Google that. It pops right up and look at those nine principles of policing. The most important one is that the police are the community and the community are the police. It talks about how the police cannot get respect from the community if they don't give that respect to the community first and earn the respect to the community that they serve. It talks about using force and the level of force to be used, only that is, is needed to make an arrest, not to be excessive. It, it talks so simply, 200 plus years ago, about what we should be doing today. And guess what? 200 years later, we still haven't gotten it. We're in a much better place than we were back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The, the police department that I walked into in the 1980s and the way it was, a much better place, believe me. But we still have a long, long way to go. Patricia, your comments on the same topic. Um, how do we get uh, the, 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 the white population, as, as said, and we know it's not everybody, but to gain an understanding of the black experience? And, and um, again, just pointing to the reference that Dean Mitchell made about her son's hoodie, and have you had experience with that in terms of either advocating or, or having to offer training or advice to uh, some of your colleagues or folks in your, your area? The first thing I would say is um, people, I, I, I um, echo what everyone has said so far, and people need to be educated. Now, it's not necessarily my job to educate you on civil history. That's, I, I can lead you to a certain place, but at some point, people do need to be willing to educate themselves. I had a lot of um, uh, white former colleagues in, in my uh, prior positions in telecommunications asking, you know, what, what can we do to help you? No, it, you're, you're helping America. You're, you're, what, you're, what I'm about to tell you to do, you need to take it in as helping yourself as well as helping us. Uh, one thing as a teacher of the first year seminar experience that I definitely recommend in terms of what educators can do, incorporate this time, this place, this space that we're walking in with racial injustice into your classes. Don't uh, leave the, the elephant on the table, the moose on the table, whatever animal you have. This is something that in the first year seminar, there's actually a module on it, on race and ethnicity. And I don't just plan to do this for one night for an hour. This is something that incorporates our lifestyle. And so, and the way we're trying to move forward and do things differently. So that's one thing I would definitely say in terms of educators. I wanted to also mention some people in terms of reading, um, some, there's a few things I'd like to recommend. Uh, the first one, this is gonna follow up on what Dr. Evans was saying in terms of uh, the definition of racial inequity and talking, think about the different people trying to look over the fence. Racial inequity is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing, such as the percentages of each ethnic group in terms of dropout rates, single family home ownership, access to healthcare. And then what I'm gonna add here is police brutality or death at the hand of the police, et cetera. My source is Ibram X. Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Random House 2019. That's something that's been on TV recently. And in terms of um, some alternatives to policing that we at the Institute consider uh, po uh, possible, develop first responders and crisis intervention systems that rely on highly trained professionals other than police. And we also, and I know this has been stated, law, law enforcement should be guided by policies and training that are created and implemented through engagement with community members. So community members, that does not mean just black people. We also, we need a diverse set of people like the people we're seeing in these uh, protests right now, black, white, old, young, to have this conversation with law enforcement so they know what else is out there. The next thing I'd like for people to look into at the Institute, we created a um, book, a uh, uh, brochure called 10 Ways to Do Racial Justice Advocacy, Advocacy After You Say Black Lives Matter. Several of the points have already been covered in terms of policing, but we, uh, and even in, in terms of voting, 
since I work on the census, I did want to mention that. But, um, you know, we, we want to make sure, one of the, and I want to tie it into your original question because I know I'm, I'm doing some other stuff, but I'll, let, me, let me think this through. In terms of the census, we want to make sure that people understand how important that is. And it's only once every 10 years. It's only, it's not just for, uh, it's, it's also for children, non-citizens, renters, unemployed, all people. And I especially just want to mention the, the non-citizen piece, the undocumented piece. There's a lot of people that are not of color that believe differently in terms of who should be counted for the census. And constitutionally, all people must be counted for the census. And we need to start really, it's, it's civics. I mean, there, there's some basic things on civics and then there's some basic things on civility that I think there's, there, there needs to be that combination between what people are, uh, what people are starting to think about people that don't look or act like them. So back to, the, back to your question, I mean, I still go back to, in terms of the white people needing education. We need to educate ourselves as well, but the, in terms of the white people seeing us differently, a lot of it has to be education and conversation. Terrence, thank you, Patricia. Terrence, um, there's a question in the Q&A, and I'll ask, um, there's a few that popped up in the chat box earlier that we may have skipped. I'll ask from um, the audience to put their um, questions in the Q&A. There's one in there now that I'd like to read, if you don't, um, so that we don't miss it. It's, uh, and I'm assuming this is mostly for, um, it'll probably be for Judge Pratt or for Director DeMeo. It's from someone in our community. What legal advice can you give to our young black adults, both male and female in the urban areas who encounter the police, perhaps being pulled over. I just lost the question. Uh, the question was perhaps being pulled over and what are their rights that they should know before they're detained? Well, I could talk on the, uh, the first part of the question as far as um, what to do when pulled over or encountered by a police officer. And Judge Pratt, if you want to pick up on the you know rights uh, of those individuals, secondary, um, yeah, the, the the best advice I can give, and and we do it with the, all the kids that go through our youth academy every summer, is just be respectful. You know, from our police officers, you know, there's no way I can guarantee that every situation is going to turn out a certain way. That's why we have a disciplinary process. But you you have a 99% chance of when one of our officers is, is encountering you, he's encountering you and treating you the right way. Um, you know, most of the times that we encounter people, and it just happened here a couple of days ago, it's not us just randomly saying, hey, let's go, let's go stop uh, Terrence, or let's go stop Aaron. It's somebody calls us and says, this person did this, or I think this person is looking in cars, or whatever it may be. So the police now go, they have to stop these individuals, and if the police right away are met with, why are you stopping me, why are you doing this, and the person gets enraged and, and is mad, and in today's climate, with everything that's going on, it happens. Now the officer has to be very well trained in de-escalation and attempt to bring that person back down to, to calmness because if the officer's not, and we see it in a lot of different places, that aggression that's, that's, uh, that's started by the person who's being stopped, now the officer gets aggressive, that person goes to the next level, now it becomes physical, and now you have a huge uh, confrontation, people injured, people under arrest over something that was probably nothing. Look at uh, some of these incidents. Come on. Somebody's out in the street corner selling a loose cigarette and it results in a death. That is ridiculous. You know, was it that important for that arrest to be made or that summons to be issued for somebody selling a loose cigarette? It's not, a, it, the situations can get escalated very easily. It's our job as a police department that no matter what and no matter how we're spoken to or treated, it's our job to de-escalate the situation. But really everybody just needs to, Take a step back and just be respectful to the officer that's stopping you as well. You're getting pulled over. Be respectful to the officer. I, I tell people all the time, 28 years in the city of Newark, probably 10 to 15 of those years I was out in the street capacity where I would actually have been pulling cars over. And there's never been one time in my career that I ever issued a summons to anyone that was respectful. Anyone that was respectful. Start the situation right and the situation will end right. 
Is every officer going to be like that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But our goal should be to make every officer be that way. Judge Pratt, if you want to give a comment on that, and then I would like, uh, as we begin to uh, prepare to wrap up, we started about five minutes after two, so we'll go to about 3.20. We were supposed to uh, end about 3.15. Um, what I would like everyone to sort of comment on as uh, after uh, Judge Pratt is what would be your response to someone saying to you, all lives matter, not just black lives matter. And so that's a constant conversation that's on every social media platform. Um, it's a conversation that's happening on campus right now amongst our students um, as well. So I would like to get your thoughts on that. Um, and there are perhaps a few more questions. If we have time, we can uh, get to. Thank you, Ms. Williamson, for posting the uh, reference uh, in the chat as well. Judge? Yeah. So, I mean, very briefly, you know, you do have the right to remain silent when um, they pull you over. You, if they ask you for your documents, you must produce them if you don't have to consent to a search of your vehicle. That does not mean that the officer might not find um, an exception to um, the unlawful search and seizure and search it anyway as well. Um, if you are arrested, you know, you do have the right to have a public defender, um, which I suggest you ask for one if you are arrested immediately and you don't have a family attorney or somewhere to get one. Um, you don't have to answer questions about where you're born, if you're a citizen and things of that nature. Now, I say all of these things with a caveat. Be real careful with how you engage the police officer who has stopped you. Because my advice in court typically is yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Because the job of the young person and, and, and the person who we know, uh, the African-American male primarily who's getting um, harmed in these stops is to get home, is to get home. That is your primary function is to get home and to not um, create a situation where you might not get home. And there are, I mean, Newark right now has a civilian review board that it started. There's also, um, you know, the Office of Internal Affairs that you can go and use these offices to report officers if you feel that you haven't been treated properly. But I always suggest you do as much as you can to get home. And, and that might oftentimes be lowering your voice, um, not falling for bait. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I am the mother of, of a young black son. I just had a young boy and um, I've been worried for, um, I was worried before this as someone who's been involved in this, who's been looking at the systems, but your job is really to just get home. And, and so again, not to not use your rights, but to be careful about how you engage the person who has stopped you. Thank you, Judge. I'm not sure how it's happening, but I'm thinking I'm hearing a baby crying in the background. Is that just me? I, I, okay, I didn't, okay. Um, and so the, in terms of the, the comment and the conversation that's happening, all lives matter, uh, not just black lives. What are your thoughts uh, uh, around that uh, conversation, Aaron? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think that statement centers on um, uh, a point of ignorance in the fact that when you look historically, um, black lives have not been included in that uh, in that saying, right? When we look at 1619, when, we were, when our ancestors were brought here and property um, and worked for hundreds of years for uncompensated labor considered three-fifths of the human we fast forward right and we look at the economic the uh, the impact of the uh, criminal justice system on the black community i want to lift up a few numbers in, in new jersey uh the black the white median white uh household uh wealth is three hundred fifty two thousand dollars. the black family is six thousand dollars six thousand one hundred dollars Fast forward to look at Newark, New Jersey, home ownership rate compared to Milbourne, which is a majority white uh, city. The black ownership, the home ownership rate in, New Jer in Newark is 23%. The home ownership rate in, in Milbourne is 81%. Um, New Jersey was the last state to abolish uh, uh, chattel slavery. Um, two thirds of all people enslaved in the North uh, were in New Jersey. Um, when we look at how this economic impact in many of the other forms of oppression impacts the black community 
more than other communities, it centers on that original kidnapping. And that is why I think it's imperative that we lift up um, our, our 10 Ways to Do Racial Justice document. One of our demands is for a reparations task force and, and more importantly, for New Jersey to implement uh, reparations legislation. Uh, we need reparations at a local, state, and federal level. Um, reparations will play a pivotal role in repairing a lot of the harm that has been done over 400 years that has not gone addressed, right? I mean, America has never really been slave. We still see the economic impacts in our community. COVID-19 has exposed us further where we see black people are morally, more so impacted by COVID, impacted by the um, unemployment rate that COVID has resulted in, also impacted by the uh, high eviction rates. And even to the point that at one point, Newark had more COVID cases and deaths than many states across the country. It was about a month ago where I was doing research on that in, in the majority black city uh, severely impacted by COVID. So I think that when I look at that statement, um, uh, it, it's not true, right? I think that black, like, we say we decry Black Lives Matter because we, that's been a crop for 400 years, over 400 years. And the only way we're going to see that address is that we, we, we continue to say it, but not only we, we engage in action uh, through policy and other forms to eradicate uh, these systems of oppression. You know, oppression was by design, so it's important that our liberation is by design. And so uh, as we begin, thank you, uh, Aaron, uh, begin to close out. Is there anybody else that would like to comment on that? And then I would like to end uh, with Dr. Uh, Evans and Dr. Lamy, just to give some feedback in terms of what can college students and educators do uh, to be, become a part of the change, to change the, to transform the protest into power. Judge uh, Pratt? Yeah, I'd just like to give, um, I think an athlete gave this example on the All Lives Matter issue. You have three homes on a block. The house on the far right gets burned, gets set on fire. The other two homes receive protection and are not set on fire. The house that matters is the house that keeps getting set on fire. And so this idea that we can ignore what's happening to unarmed African-American men and women is offensive in this country. It's offensive. It's actually offensive to say it because the other lives are not in danger. They're receiving protection like the other homes. They're receiving protection and they're not being um, murdered with unfettered discretion. And so uh, that for me was like the best example of why um, Black Lives Matter because it's the house that's being set on fire and no one's protecting it. Profound analogy. I have a similar uh, example like that. I won't give the example because it's so similar, but the end of it basically is saying Black Lives Matter too, or Black Lives Matter also. It seems like a lot of people, when they hear Black Lives Matter, they're automatically offended because we're saying, it, by saying Black Lives Matter, we're, we're saying others do not. We already know, we already know that all lives matter. But what we're trying to do is bring to the forefront to your knowledge and your recognition and your acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter too. And I want to jump in there very quickly and kind of give my little closing remarks on this. You know, I've been doing this, like I said, for, for decades now. And it kind of reminded me again when we start talking about diversity and multiculturalism back in the day, uh, when we all bleed red, uh, you know, we're uh, a melting pot, you know, so everybody should be again a part of the melting pot. And again, the whole field of diversity and multiculturalism started going to looking at the salad bowl, the fruit bowl, that we all can value and prize each other, even though we're different, right? That should be the goal, the ultimate the, 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 the prizing and the valuing and respecting of others because they're different. I shouldn't have to be white to be all right, okay? I shouldn't have to have these different types of characteristics for you to accept me. Now, when I hear the term all lives matter and people get really offended by it, uh, if I say black lives matter, and then some people say, but, but shouldn't all lives matter? I look at really what place is that coming from? Actually, I think there's some good people trying to understand the concept of black lives matter. You know, uh, Judge Pratt gave some examples and, you know, we give different ones, like for instance, uh, if you have a broken arm and you go into the emergency room, you don't want the doctor to say, well, I, I'm worried about all your bones. Because right now, though, I need you to focus on my arm because my arm is broken, right? 
or if you have cancer and you go into the hospital again and if you have breast cancer but somebody says well all cancers matter well right now i'm only focused on this because this is where again the disease is or this is where the need is or this is whatever yes my whole body i should be worried about but right now the whole focus and emphasis is on black lives matter because it's in education in health in in the legal system all these different areas we are not treated equitably it simply is not happening the research shows it over and over and over again so how do we help people the well-intentioned people really see the story understand the story and why we need their support it just can't be us and i, I said in a town hall recently how i get sick and tired of having to explain this over and over again because me if you have a sense of any sense in your brain you should be able to get it but some people still don't so i know i still have to educate so as a teacher um you know what can i do as a president what can i do to help my students uh, when they do encounter someone um, that they need to educate or help. Not everybody will get it, but how do we move forward? It's like everybody having common sense. Everybody doesn't have common sense. They're educated fools too. I will say that as well. But it's still my responsibility as a educator and as, as a president to make sure I have this in front of my students, that I'm advocating for my students, that I'm making sure that as, as, as faculty, and the faculty, the faculty we have at Bloomfield College are phenomenal. The staff we have, as you can see by some of them right here, are phenomenal. We are at Bloomfield College for a reason, and that is to have that impact. So I want to kind of close with that note, but I thought I would share that two cents. I appreciate uh, that. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, Dean, Dr. Uh, Lammy, uh, what can college students do and educators do to become a part of the change? And we do have, um, if anybody wanted to just comment on these final thoughts as well, we can close with that. Um, we had one anonymous attendee says, as we are looking at building community, I would love for there to be a collaboration with Bloomfield College and Bloomfield School District. So I definitely want to share that with the deans and also Dr. Evans through the teacher education program where opportunities can be given to future teachers of color. Has there been a discussion in regards to that specific initiative? And then we have another attendee who uh, posted. Sure, go. Mm -hmm. It has working with you know superintendent and also Montclair schools as well uh, because they're, they're trying to get more students of color and working with the education department. We just got to get them to pass this test. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And then um, this was also placed in the check and in, in the question, so I wanted to address it. it. Says that they personally feel as if the social classes that touch upon subjects like racial injustices and inequality do not properly educate the students. This may be as a result of our whitewash education system, but my question is, what can we do or what is being done to actually fully educate people about social issues, which I think uh, connects to the question about the power of college students and educators. Dr. Lamy? Well, I think the conversations like this one in particular, um, taking time to engage in these uncomfortable conversations about real issues um, we often spend time, we can spend time on topics that are really insignificant. We, we all can do that during the course of our day, but uh, for our students and for our community to kind of set aside some times to deal with the issues that can really bring about some level of change in our society. Whether it is about census, whether it's about voting, whatever it is about social inequality, um, having those hard conversations, not only in this forum, but also infusing that in the curriculum so that these conversations happen in the classroom, outside the classroom. More importantly, students need to start talking with each other. Sometimes, you know, the conversations that young folks need to have need to be based on some real social issues. And there is no greater social issue right now than the, one, than the ones we're, 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 we're tackling this afternoon. So I think for our students, is really don't be afraid to let your voice be heard. Um, make sure that you're part of the narrative um, that's going to change this world that we all are occupying and sharing together. And you matter more than anything else as individuals. And the collection of your thoughts, energy, and passion and commitment can make a difference. And our students are some of the most courageous young men and women I've ever met, which is why I've been at this institution for so long, because they deserve the best of me and the best of our community. And we know that we can get the best of them and um, at any point in time. So to our students, stay focused, stay committed, stay engaged, more importantly, stay alert and woke. Um, 
this world that we're living right now requires for you to open your eyes and understand your position and how you fit in changing our society. Um, to our panelists, I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I want to thank Judge Pratt, Director DeMeo, Aaron Green, Patricia Williamson, our president. I want to thank our moderator, Terrence Banks, and I want to thank Rose Mitchell for jumping on with us and sharing some really important thoughts and questions. Uh, I appreciate all of you for taking the time today because um, you know you didn't have to do this. You could have been doing something else. And, but you decide to commit to our community and to our students and to our faculty, to our staff, to our viewers on Facebook, to our viewers on, on, on this platform here on Zoom. Um, we thank you and thank you for all you do and continue to do the great work that you all are doing. And we appreciate you at the college. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamy. Thanks, thank you all again. We will uh, make this video available via our YouTube page uh, for the Center for Student Leadership and Engagement. We will definitely share it. Uh, Director DeMeo, uh, we have our uh, new student and, and parent orientation. I'll definitely reach out to you uh, today or tomorrow via email uh, about a message uh, from you uh, to them. We appreciate everyone's engagement today. And there will be a part two, so we'll be calling you back in the fall uh, to follow up and hopefully engage with some of our student leaders. Uh, this evening at six o'clock, we have a second webinar, uh, which will focus on uh, environmental uh, justice uh, issues. And so if you're interested in joining that, log back on at six o'clock. Uh, you can go on our Facebook pages, uh, Bloomfield or the Center for Student Leadership for that information. Until next time, we are signing off live from the College Center and uh, we appreciate you. Thank you for engaging with us virtually. Thank you. Thank you.